Good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and greetings from Pakistan. I would like to begin by thanking the government of Korea not only for convening this important seminar, but also for their efforts to promote regional collaboration and for highlighting the interlinkages between public health and socio-economic concerns, which COVID-19 has so brutally brought to bear. In fact, COVID-19 has reminded us how important health systems are. And while facing the brunt of the pandemic, we have also been reminded that poor health has serious economic consequences on the one hand, whereas on the other, freedom from poverty is a strong determinant of health status achievement. Today, I'm very pleased to share with you that the government of Pakistan addressed both the health issue as well as the socioeconomic fallout of the health issue with equal attention. Our COVID-19 health strategy was multi-pronged. We focused on disease containment and increased our testing capacity from 450 a day to 80,000 a day. We have been able to increase the number of laboratories from 3 to 128 as we moved from a generalized to a localized lockdown. Alongside, we also ramped up our health systems capacity. We added 2,000 ICU beds, we trained over a 100,000 health workers and we developed a system to monitor 800 hospitals in real time. There were SOPs developed for every aspect of the situation uh, and a concerted focus on risk communication throughout the pandemic. And all this was enabled through multi-sectoral national governance and coordination across all levels of the government in Pakistan's federal polity. The combined effect of all these measures was an early decline. In fact, a month earlier than all projections. And I'm humbled to say that our government's efforts are now being recognized internationally. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the lockdowns were a desperate measure for desperate times. And governments in many countries of our region were faced with tough choices throughout. We knew that shutting down the economy meant decimating our livelihoods and opening it facilitated virus spread. Here in my own country, Pakistan, which is the fifth largest country in the world, there are 24 million breadwinners who rely on daily wages or are self-employed in the informal economy. And life for them virtually came to a standstill with implementation of the lockdown in March. In fact, there were beginnings of civil unrest and rioting caused by widespread loss of livelihoods after about two weeks. So to respond to this challenge, the government of Pakistan created the SAS emergency cash program, which is the largest social protection program ever in the history of the country. This program was rolled out within 10 days of the lockdown to deliver one-time emergency cash grants. 1.23 billion US dollars were allocated to support more than 16.9 million families, which covers around 109 million people given family size, and this is approximately 50% of the country's population. We use digital capabilities established over the past year as part of SRS, which is Pakistan's new poverty alleviation framework, to deliver SRS emergency cash. We adopted a hybrid targeting approach combining emergency assistance for the known vulnerable with demand-based support for the new poor. We sought requests through an SMS short code service uh, and then we used data analytics for eligibility ascertainment, drawing on unique national identification numbers uh, and using survey data and wealth proxies. And then payments were biometrically verified. The system that we developed was end-to-end -end data driven. It was fully automated. It was rule-based. It was transparent and it was totally politically neutral. Prior to the delivery of this emergency cash relief, I traveled to several parts of the country and saw unspeakable suffering firsthand. I met daily wage laborers without work for weeks, their families on the verge of starvation. Hawkers forced out of work due to the lockdown. I saw staff from otherwise busy hotels and restaurants now sitting at home not knowing how to pay house rent and bills. I met domestic servants, gardeners, security guards, drivers, industrial daily wages laid off by their employers. 
I met fishermen and miners not knowing what to do with their work setting suddenly coming to a halt. I met transport contractors, bus drivers, hawkers in bus stations, all of them who were out of a job. There were beauticians and barbers who would otherwise make a decent living with suddenly no customers. There were millions of shopkeepers in our cash disbursement points who had been on the verge of hunger with their savings consumed and who were living behind the shutters of their closed shops. There were teachers in private schools with severance letters. There were electricians, welders, painters, carpenters, plumbers, car mechanics, construction, labor, not knowing where the next meal was coming from. I met taxi drivers who had not had a passenger for weeks on end. And the story was repeated across industries and geographies, with even those used to earning a decent living suddenly wondering if their balance sheets would ever square again. The rupees 12,000 or the 75 US dollars that we were giving to these families brought stability and it brought much comfort to millions of families. The whole nation watched as millions of tragedies were averted. And for me personally, it was the most humbling experience of my entire career to be leading SAS emergency cash to distribute money to half the people of my country at a time of extreme uncertainty. But beyond the immediate crisis, the success of Exas Emergency Cash offers Pakistan and other middle and low income countries invaluable experience in delivering a massive national program in a context of complexity and uncertainty with speed. So in order to share this knowledge, this week we released a report detailing know-how gained in the program's design and implementation, as well as the operational challenges encountered and the means of their mitigation. In a nutshell, our experience has showed us that by combining phones, internet connectivity and national identity card numbers, a digital demand-based social protection system can be created to enable those in distress to seek social support during crises. It demonstrated to us how cash transfer programs can be deployed to counter the socioeconomic fallout due to external shocks such as COVID-19, uh, which presents a long-term challenge. For Pakistan, this was a watershed moment in terms of government functioning. It made the government more agile, more data-driven. It made us more experimental and ambitious. It helped us with the fast-track adoption of cost-effective digital ways of working and new ways of coordination across multiple stakeholders through a whole-of-government approach. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the legacy of such a program is not simply short-term relief. Built into its design are long-term goals to strengthen safety nets and increase financial inclusion, both of which we believe will bring lasting benefits to recipients and to Pakistan as a whole. Alongside this is a commitment to transparency and accountability, which was also the underlying motivation for the publication of the report we have just released, because I believe that in order for democracies to deliver it is essential for a culture of integrity and openness to be ingrained in government institutions and processes. History shows us that disasters and their tragic consequences can be an opportunity to catalyze large-scale social change. And our experience in Pakistan leads us to believe that it is possible to rise to the occasion. So it may be a bit cliched, but this crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, may well have a silver lining. We need to bring to bear that the cost of COVID-19 is not limited to lives lost and morbidity. The cost of COVID-19 is staggering in terms of hunger, children dropping out of school and foregone health care. And as always, it is the women and children that are disproportionately going to bear the brunt of this tragedy. In fact, COVID-19 is threatening to reverse three decades of gains in poverty eradication. The MDG on poverty eradication was achieved five years ahead of schedule, but now with the corresponding SDG, we are sadly moving backwards and fast. The scale of the action demanded from the world is unprecedented. And just to put things in perspective, there are four billion individuals in this world today without social protection. 
So it is a moral imperative for the international system to prioritize poverty alleviation and social protection, especially in view of a possible protracted crisis which COVID-19 presents and its long-term consequences for vulnerable groups. This is perhaps the worst moment the world has faced since the end of the Second World War. But in our darkest hour, we now have a one in a generation chance to build a fairer world that ends poverty, inequality and the climate crisis. I believe with imagination and commitment, we can address rising inequality and advance the attainment of SDGs in a post COVID-19 world. I want to thank the government of Korea once again for playing a catalytic part in a transformation which I believe must happen. I thank you.